Well, it's really very nice to be able to join in with these lectures and to have a part in this subject, such a beautiful subject, to think about how the Lord Jesus is our great example. All these sessions that are scheduled, uh, these are going to be very encouraging and instructive uh, sessions for each one of us, I'm sure. And I would dearly love to uh, be part of the session live, but uh, circumstances have caused me to uh, record a message and uh, share it this way, this occasion. Uh, but uh, I'll be praying for uh, the day that you're enjoying together uh, right now as uh, we look at the scriptures together. It's going to be our opportunity to turn to Philippians chapter 2. And uh, I've uh, opened there. Philippians chapter 2, and the session that we have ahead of us brings us to a passage that perhaps if we have uh, fellowshiped with believers uh, for any length of time, we've heard this passage read aloud and uh, taken up as this beautiful example of how the Lord Jesus himself entered this world, what it was that he uh, took upon himself and how he has done the will of God in such beauty and uh, humility of character. But as we uh, understand that we desire to benefit from this passage, not only in a devotional sense, but also in a, uh, an understanding of how his example should affect us, um, I think we'll be able to really benefit from this passage together. So let's read uh, together Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, and then look at our subject a little further. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, and I'm reading from the New King James translation. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's just ask the Lord to uh, bless us as we look at this passage together. God and Father, we just want to pray now for this session as we'll look at these words about the Lord Jesus. We pray that as we uh, benefit from them, that you will use them to mold us to be more like himself, like the one in whom you have found all your delight. And uh, our Savior, Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for what we have read. And we pray that as we consider what you have done, that uh, it will uh, have an effect in our hearts, too, through the work of your spirit, and that we will be conformed even more, our God and Father, to the image of your Son. So we commit ourselves into your hands as we look at these words together now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we look at the epistle of the Philippians, it's really wonderful to see how this passage fits into the uh, subject overall. Uh, I'm just looking back now at chapter one of this epistle, and we see the greeting uh, from Paul and Timothy, who are bond servants of Jesus Christ, and they're writing to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. And perhaps we would remember the history of those who are in Philippi. This uh, gathering of believers, which was formed when uh, Paul and Silas visited that city. They were in prison. They were praising the Lord overnight, and the prison was shaken. And uh, through various circumstances, 
there was a, uh, a conversation with the jailer. And so who was it that was the uh, very first ones gathering together in Philippi? We would say it was uh, Lydia who had greeted Paul uh, when there was a time of prayer when they first arrived in that city. And we would perhaps include that uh, servant, girl, servant girl who had been formerly possessed by, by demons and uh, the, she was used and abused by those who were uh, her masters. And we would include the, the jailer and his family. What a, a diverse group of people. Lydia, a businesswoman, well-to-do, a poor servant girl who is uh, enslaved by those who wish to make gain of her, a jailer who is uh, employed by uh, the city to do a task, and uh, now he himself has uh, been transformed in his life by the work of the Lord Jesus, and now there have been others as well added to their number. And here we see that they're identified along with the bishops and deacons in verse one. This is a very unique aspect of the book of Philippians. Uh, we don't have a reference uh, to bishops and deacons in the greeting of other epistles, but here in Philippi, there are those who are functioning well, as we are sure was the case in other uh, assembly gatherings of believers. And yet here they're identified uh, in a unique way with the bishops and deacons. There are those who are carrying on the work of spiritual oversight and who are uh, watching for the souls of uh, the believers who fellowship there together. God is using them in the lives of uh, the believers who meet together. And there are deacons. There are those who are serving well. There are those who are uh, carrying on the, the uh, practical needs of those who gather together and who are uh, helping to uh, manage what is needed practically and who are attentive to those needs. God has uh, given them this responsibility and they are identified here uh, in the beginning of this letter. And in chapter, uh, in, still in chapter one, in verse uh, six, we're told that uh, Paul is confident that he who has begun a good work in these believers will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so not only is there something very attractive about their fellowship together, but there is something very certain about the work of God among these believers in Philippi. In their hearts, he is not going to stop until the work is complete in the day of Jesus Christ, that perfect day when believers will finally be brought into the presence of the Lord Jesus and all the things which are useless will be set aside. But later in chapter one, Verse 27, Paul says, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so now we come to that point in chapter one, and we might think, well, we're, we're informed in the beginning of the chapter that there are those who are carrying on their spiritual responsibilities uh, as these Christians in Philippi fellowship together. And there is the certainty that God is at work in the hearts of every one of these believers. And so with that uh, background, and then we hear the words of the Apostle Paul, uh, stand fast, stand firm, stand together. What is it that is going to keep them united together? What is it that's going to keep them standing firm and, and uh, moving forward? Evidently, it's not enough to only have believers who are fitted for service. And uh, it's uh, also the, there's a need for the practical application of, of some other teaching added on to uh, what God is doing inside of them. There is something else for them to keep their eyes upon. What is it that is going to keep them on the pathway that God wants for them so that they are striving together, moving forward together? And the answer to the, that question is, it's the example of Christ Jesus that we have in chapter two. Uh, 
And all this by way of introduction, perhaps there is nothing more valuable than this in our times as well. Perhaps this is exactly the, the time when we need the example of Christ even more um, impressed upon our hearts, even more thoroughly to make an impact in our thoughts. Because certainly there is always uh, a need for us to be reminded of the uh, unifying example of the humility of Christ, the mind of Christ. But perhaps in our days, in our times, right now, in circumstances which many are passing through, perhaps it's all the more valuable that we have our eyes turned upon his example. And so while we know that God is working within us. We also want to have our eyes turned upon the Lord Jesus and to respond to this uh, exhortation. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. How is this to be? Verse five of chapter two says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so as we uh, look at this passage now a little bit further in more detail, we can uh, appreciate the uh, aspects that are recorded for us here. There's some really beautiful uh, structure to this passage. We see that he was in the form of God in verse 6, and then he also uh, came in the form of a bondservant, and we can look at this a little further. We see that he uh, emptied himself, and also he humbled himself. These expressions are found in the in the passage where it says that he made himself of no reputation. Other translations say he he made himself empty and he also made himself lowly. We can consider this a little further as well. And we see these uh, steps downward to the lowest place of humility. And then we see the answer to that humility in his upward exaltation. There's that beautiful uh, hymn that we sometimes uh, sing that uh, all the uh, sorrow, all the marks of sorrow are told in answering glory. All the Lord's suffering has been answered by the uh, exaltation that has been brought uh, for him, given to him. And so uh, rightfully, he has received that place of honor. But as we look at these uh, steps downward, we can uh, recognize, uh, first of all, that some have uh, counted these a little differently. Uh, some I've, I've heard some say, well, there's four different steps downward. Some have said there's seven steps downward. Uh, I kind of like the seven steps downward and some even count them a little differently uh, as to which ones are the seven steps. Um, but we'll just go through this passage and take a look at these uh, statements about the Lord Jesus. And I would say that we have, first of all, uh, an identify identification of who he was. He was the one who is in the form of God, in the form of God. And this uh, expression indicates not simply that he uh, looked like God or that he seemed to be behaving like God, this idea of form is where we get our English word morphology. It's a science word. It's the, it's the very identification of who someone is. Of, of, uh, in the science worlds, there is a certain morphology of, of animals and of plants. The Lord Jesus is in the form of God. He is himself God. He is the very substance of what God is because he himself is God. We're told this with certainty in John chapter 1 that the one who is the word was with God and at the very same time the word was God and is God. Somehow there is this beautiful complexity to the God of the Bible that he the son, he the word is himself God, and yet God has this triunity of persons, this uh, unity of being. There is one God, and somehow there are uh, persons of that Godhead, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. This is not our subject, but it's so 
uh, tremendous really to appreciate who the God of the Bible is, his tremendous complexity. And the fact that Jesus Christ, the one who came into this world, is himself in the form of God. He himself is God. And knowing this certainty, being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. And this is a very unique expression, and different translations represent it differently. Uh, we can read this in a var variety of ways uh, when we look in other translations. Various uh, renderings have been proposed of exactly what this means. It's a unique expression. And the, uh, the essential theme or the essential point seems to be that he was not, um, he, he was not concerned that someone might mistake him for not being God, if we could say it in such a way. He did not have to grasp tightly to his divinity, to his deity. He knew who he was. He knows that he is God. He did not have to uh, feel uh, uncertain that uh, someone might take this from him. He did not cling to it as though it was something that might be lost. We have in the scriptures those who sought deity or sought to be recognized as somehow divine. Of course, the primary example is Lucifer himself, the one who said, I will be like the Most High, and he was cast out. We have an example in Acts chapter 12 of uh, Herod Agrippa, uh, known to history as uh, Herod Agrippa I. And that Herod, he uh, dressed in a, uh, a fine robe. History tells us he dressed in a robe that uh, had a silvery sheen to it. And there in the sun, as the sun glinted off his robe, uh, there was this glimmering light. And the people who were trying to flatter him as he began to speak, they said, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. And because he did not turn aside such flattering words that would uh, speak of him as though he were divine, because he accepted that kind, of, uh, that kind of approval, that kind of flattery, God struck him down. There is no one whom God is going to share his glory with. I am God. There is none other. We have several chapters in the book of Isaiah where this is uh, the primary theme. God safeguarding his own glory. But there is no need to safeguard it from the one who himself is God. And there is no need for the Lord Jesus to uh, grasp after his deity as if it could be taken away from him. He himself is God. And it was not something that he had to uh, feel, uh, feel uh, as if there was any danger of that position being taken from him. And I just would like to speak a little further about this. We see this emphasized in the Gospels that uh, he always knew who he was, even here on earth. He knew who he was. We have uh, these examples in John's gospel, for example, that he came from God and he was going to God. John 13 says this, that uh, just those hours before the cross, the Lord Jesus, knowing that he had come from God and was going to God. And in John 17, as he's praying to his father, he says, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. This uh, eternal glory that the Lord Jesus had as the divine son with the father. There is a conscious awareness of the joys that existed in eternity past with the father. And when he stands before Pilate and Pilate says, are you a king? He says, I am. And when he stands before the high priest, uh, in Mark's gospel in particular, the high priest says, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? The Lord Jesus says, Mark 14 records it this way, I am. And he refers to this uh, prophetic uh, reference in, in the book of Daniel about the, the divine son of man who is going to come in glory 
And the high priest knew exactly what the Lord Jesus was speaking about because he tore his clothes and accused him of blasphemy. No one else should talk like this but God. And But the Lord Jesus, he was no pretender. He knew his divine place. He knew his deity. He knew that he was able to forgive sins. In Luke chapter 5, we have the reference to the uh, paralyzed man. And the Lord Jesus declares forgiveness of sins for that man. It's recorded in Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel also. And in Luke 7, he forgives the sins of that woman, uh, the woman of the city who comes in and everyone knows she's a sinner. But the Lord Jesus declares forgiveness of sins for her. And those who are listening, they say, who is this that forgives sins? Earlier in Luke 5, they had said, only God can forgive sins. And they're right. Only God can forgive sins. But the Lord Jesus uh, does not shrink back from declaring forgiveness of sins because of his divine character. He knew who he was. He knew his divine uh, position. And yet he did not grasp after that as if there was some possibility of losing it. There was no, uh, no, no effort to maintain it because it's simply who he was. And in this glorious statement of who the Lord Jesus is, we then move into these steps that the Lord Jesus uh, began to walk his pathway to uh, come downward into our world. And we see, first of all, that it says that he uh, made himself of no reputation, as the New King James says. I mentioned earlier that uh, other translations put this, he emptied himself or he made himself empty we have to be so cautious as to how we describe uh, what this means we are reading a passage that uh, almost uh, even by uh, trying to uh, give an, uh, an exposition of it we're in danger of, of uh, speaking incorrectly and so we want to be very careful the Lord Jesus did not empty himself of his divinity. The fact that this is the first uh, step of humility that's recorded does not mean that he's emptying himself of his divinity, his deity, as others have, uh, have uh, expressed in uh, a, a sentence that, that uh, represents this thought it has been said, he never ceased to be what he always was, when he became what he had never been before. He never ceased to be what he always was when he became what he never was before. And so he emptied himself. He made himself empty. This expression about becoming empty uh, is used in other uh, aspects in the scriptures that uh, things are, are made to be vain. Like the Apostle Paul once is saying, um, I don't want my, uh, my, my boasting about your spiritual progress to be, to be vain, that it would be caused to be empty by, by some external factor. And in most of the usage of this term in the scriptures, we see that some external factor is causing an emptiness. But the Lord Jesus, he made himself empty. And perhaps we could say that this emptiness was that he was willing to relinquish the joys and the glories of his divine position in heaven. He always was and is divine. But those joys and glories which he enjoyed as part of that relationship, his, his relationship with the Father, Rejoicing before him, as it says in Proverbs chapter 8, in that prophetic uh, uh, description of what it was like for the divine son and father together to be uh, enjoying that relationship. And he uh, was, was willing to relinquish those joys and those glories for a time. We also, on the other hand, are told that he always, as son, was in the bosom of the Father. How can it be that he would relinquish those? Uh, we, we can only say what the scriptures uh, tell us. And so we see that he emptied himself. And then we see that the next phrase is that he 
took the form of a bond servant. And so we might think of one who is uh, a, a, uh, some princely official who is willing to relinquish his, his royal robes uh, for, some, for, some, uh, for some purpose. But would such a one be willing to become a servant? Would he take the form of a servant? And again, this is the same word as being in the form of God. Now he is, uh, has the form of a servant. He takes the form of a bond servant. And it's not just, as we might say, the, the costume of a bond servant, not just the trappings of a bond servant. He takes the form, the being of a bond servant. We could think of how in the Gospel of John, uh, it mentions, I found 40 times where he speaks about being the one who has been sent. In the Gospel of John, the, the Gospel which reveals perhaps more than any other his, his divinity. And yet in that very same gospel, it emphasizes over and over. He says, the father who sent me, the father who sent me, I've come to do the will of him who sent me. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. He is that divine and perfect servant. And yet we might say that this still was not the end of his uh, downward steps of humility because even angels are servants. Angels are ministering spirits. They are servants for the sake of the uh, ones who belong to God. But he would not even be content to be an angelic servant. He would be, as it says here next, he came in the likeness of men, the likeness of men. And this word likeness has to do, it seems, with the uh, the, uh, the, the, the appearance, the, the category of, of mankind, uh, we're told in Romans chapter eight, that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He took on that category, that category of humanity. Now, the category does not mean that he uh, himself is that he is not merely human. He still is that divine son of God. But he came in the category of humanity, the likeness of sinful flesh. That does not mean, again, of course, that he himself was uh, in that uh, condition of sinful flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh, we're told in Romans chapter 8. And it's another interesting uh, use of this word in Romans chapter 1. It says that I'm just going to turn uh, actually to, to Romans 1 for a moment to analyze this passage a little further. In Romans chapter 1, uh, we're told in, um, we could look at uh, verse 23, Romans 1 verse 23. Uh, here, those who were foolish and abandoned God uh, in their thoughts, it says that they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. This is our word uh, here again, this word like, the likeness. And it's very interesting here that in Romans chapter one, those who had made themselves enemies of God were demeaning him by making images that looked like corruptible man and calling this their God. But in Philippians chapter two, the Lord Jesus, he comes in the likeness of humanity, and it is a display of the glory of God to do so. Sinful man would impose this upon him as if uh, he's nothing more than a man. They would bring God down to their level. He's nothing more than a man. But the Lord Jesus would come in the likeness of humanity to show that God himself, the savior God is willing to stoop into the category of humanity in order to accomplish the salvation that was still to come. But that's not uh, the only, uh, the end of that uh, step downward. We see next that he's found in appearance as a man, or the King James Version says, in fashion 
as a man. And this word seems to have to do with with the circumstances of humanity. It's it's the word uh, schema. We sometimes use that word in English. The the framework, the circumstances. Uh, the word is used in First um, Corinthians chapter seven, where it talks about the fashion of the world that is passing away. And this is the same expression here. It's the, the, the temporary circumstances. He came into the circumstances of mankind. He, he was not merely in the category of humanity um, as if uh, he was uh, temporarily taking some, uh, some foreign position and just uh, acting as if it were true. But no, he came into our circumstances. He was found in fashion as a man. He came into our circumstances. He knows what our circumstances are like. He knows what sorrows are. He knows what uh, the emptinesses of life are like. We think about how he was uh, mistreated by his own family, how he was accused of so many uh, hateful things by those who heard him. And he understands what our circumstances are like. He understands the uh, rejection. He understands the sorrows. He understands uh, being destitute. He understands the uh, impact of living in a fallen world. He has been found in fashion as a man in our circumstances. But then even further, he humbled himself. There are some very glorious men in this world. And uh, one might say, well, he could have come into this world and he could have uh, uh, taken upon himself the, that form and uh, that, uh, that, that category of humanity. He could have taken upon himself the form of a bond servant. He could have uh, been found in appearance and fashion as a man in our circumstances and yet still could have uh, lives a very comfortable existence. There are some very dignified and, and well-off people in this world, but that's not how the Lord Jesus entered this world. He humbled himself. He made himself low. He made himself empty earlier, and now here in this verse, he made himself low. The uh, commentary on the book of Philippians by uh, G. Christopher Willis uh, Meditations on Philippian Sacrifices of Joy, I think, uh, is the title of his commentary. And uh, he speaks here in, in this passage, and he says that uh, the, the old Greek writers would describe the Nile River with this word. It, it ran low. It, uh, it, it had, had little. When you would look upon the, uh, the banks of the Nile River in certain times, it would be in a low condition. And that's what the Lord Jesus took upon himself. We are told in the scriptures that God is able to humble those who uh, make themselves proud, those who exalt themselves. He is able to make them humble. There was never, ever a need for the Lord Jesus to be made humble because he made himself humble. He made himself low. And uh, he came into the most humble of circumstances as we read even his, his human life here on earth. We're told in Matthew chapter 11 that he says of himself that he's meek and lowly in heart. And this reference to being lowly is uh, our word again. It's the same uh, expression here that he is uh, humble. He's lowly. He's meek. The one who is meek knows who he is but does not require the trappings of who he is and the one who is lowly has entered into humble circumstances and we find in that reference matthew eleven twenty eight, 28 that he is lowly in heart he's humble in heart it's not uh simply an outward expression an, an outward position that he takes it is in his heart the lord jesus who is in the form of God, we have come now to the humility of heart that has brought him into our circumstances. But even this uh, would not be sufficient to bring us to God. He has become obedient to the point of death. 
And this word to or unto death uh, is a unique preposition. It means uh, as far as death. The, the uh, New King James translators did not want it to sound as if he was obeying death. That's why they've added this phrase, obedient to the point of death. Uh, however, that should not be understood to mean uh, that he stopped short of death. It means that he was obedient even as far as death itself. Even the fact of his obedience is so striking. We're told in Hebrews chapter 5 that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That's so unlike us. What we have to do as human beings in our childhood and, and uh, even onward, we have to learn to obey. We have to be forced to obey. We have to be taught to obey. We have to be disciplined because we disobey. But the Lord Jesus, he never learned to obey, but he did learn obedience. He was never disobedient. He didn't have to be told to obey, but he learned obedience. He never before had been in such a position where uh, he would be the sent one, where he would have uh, a position of, of uh, that submissive character of the obedient servant. But here we find that his obedience would bring him even to death. He was obedient even as far as death itself. But even that, there's still farther to go to bring him all the way in this uh, downward stoop. And perhaps if you've been counting the seven, we find now that this is the seventh downward step and we uh, consider that it's the death of the cross even the death of the cross it's the death of the curse it's a death that he had been telling his own that he would suffer he told his own that he was going to be crucified even this was a declaration of his deity to show his uh, ability to declare what would take place before it happened the jewish people did not crucify it was the roman method of execution to crucify and yet it was the uh, attempt of the religious leaders the jewish leaders to try to cause the lord's death at one time they were going to stone him at another time they were going to try to push him off the precipice but the Lord's death was going to come by crucifixion. It was the place of the curse. We're told in Galatians chapter 3, this is affirmed for us, that the, the meaning of the cross includes the place of the curse. Christ has been made a curse for us by dying on a cross. There is a, a reference in Deuteronomy. We have reference to this in Deuteronomy chapter 21, I believe it is, where we are told that uh, the place of the cross is the place of the curse. Anyone who is put to death by hanging has been cursed. And yet we also see that Christ has redeemed us by the curse, uh, redeemed us from the curse of the law by that death, the death on the place of the curse. And so we find that this is perhaps the most uh, the furthest extent of that humiliation. It is the, the worst that could be done to him by humanity itself. This was the, the worst kind of death that could be imposed upon him. And yet when this was complete, they had nothing left. There was no other uh, hateful act to bring against him. There was no other shame that could be heaped upon him. And there on the cross, as we know, this was not merely the culmination of the hatred of mankind, nor the culmination of the uh, attack of the devil against the one who had come to destroy the devil. The devil thought his victory had been complete, but through weakness, he destroyed the one, that strong man who had the power of death and held humanity bondage through the fear of death and uh, through death he the lord jesus overcame that one 
And so this is the place of, of victory. It's the place of humility, but it's the place of victory. There on the cross, he overcame the one who had all this time opposed the God of the universe, had resisted the, uh, the desires and designs of God to uh, establish uh, a means of redemption and salvation, had used the weaknesses of humanity to uh, separate them from God's promises, to cause them to go astray, and uh, they themselves willingly going astray. All we like sheep have gone astray, the prophet Isaiah wrote. But there on the cross, the Lord Jesus not only destroyed the one who had the power of death, but he satisfied God's wrath regarding our sins. And so we come to this tremendous answer. The one who has gone through these downward steps and where we pause and we think even the death of the cross, that is where the humble path has taken him. Now we find, therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Verse 11, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And in looking at this portion of our passage, some have identified seven upward steps of exaltation. I would rather suggest, though, that the exaltation, maybe it has seven aspects or seven facets. But, you know, this was not a gradual uh, uh, display of exaltation. God has highly exalted him. There were these steps downward, these degrees of downward uh, humility that brought him even to the death of the cross. But God has highly exalted him. And we have contained in this verse the uh, resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ and the exaltation of Christ seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is given that place by God who declares that it is his by right. And even so more, even more so, he has taken that place. He has claimed that place. He sat himself down. Hebrews chapter one tells us. And so the one who has uh, gone through these steps of humility is the one who is highly exalted. He has that name of Jesus, the name which is above every other name. And so now we would pause and notice that in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 2, we have the word therefore, and the expression given now to the Philippians, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And so we have an echo now of chapter one, the God who is working in these Philippians, the God who will be glorified if they are united together, if they are uh, furthering their spiritual progress together if they are of the same mind. In fact, we saw in verse 5 as we began this passage, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, which mind is that? It's the mind of the beginning of this chapter, the mind which speaks about the uh, the uh, consolation in Christ in the beginning of this chapter, verse 1, comfort of love the fellowship of the spirit. It is the mind which uh, shows love and like-mindedness and harmony in verse two. It's the mind which refuses selfish ambition and conceit. It's the mind which is lowly in verse three, that same lowliness as our reference to the Lord humbling himself, that lowliness of mind. Uh, all expressed in one word uh, in the original there, lowliness of mind, that mind which esteems others 
better than themselves, which looks not only for our own interests, but for the interests of others in verse four. And so we also would look at this passage then, because this is not merely a, a, uh, a, a beautiful devotional look at the Lord Jesus, but it is intended to transform how we act towards one another. It is intended to shape how we view ourselves. We should know who we are, just as the Lord Jesus knew who he was. Sometimes it is said that uh, humility uh, thinks nothing of itself. You know, we, we might say, well, uh, humility thinks less of itself. And then the answer is no, humility doesn't think of itself at all. And I understand what is meant by that. But uh, I would say that we see, for example, the Apostle Paul, he knew what kind of service he was uh, intending to carry out. He expressed his desires. He said, I would like to go to Spain. I would like to go to Rome. And he knew what his desires were. This was not stubbornness or selfishness, but it was purpose of heart. And we also should have purpose of heart in knowing what it is that God wants us to do here in this world. He has fitted us for tasks of service. But how is it that we are going to carry out the tasks that he has fitted us for well we are going to if we're going to have the mind of christ we are going to relinquish the joys that we believe come with a certain position are we ready to take the mind of christ and relinquish what we believe are the joys that we feel are uh, are connected with whatever we believe God has set in front of us? Are we prepared to take the form of a servant? Are we prepared to classify ourselves as fellow human beings? We are told in Romans that we should associate uh, not just with those who are uh, high in this world, associate with the lowly. Are we prepared to enter into the circumstances of others the way the Lord Jesus entered into our circumstances? Are we uh, ready to make ourselves low? In James chapter 1, we're told that uh, those who are high in this world should rejoice in the fact that they are made low, that we don't have to be something. We can be uh, content with what God has given to us and to make ourselves low and to obey even as far as death. Are we willing to uh, obey as far as death? And hardly uh, ever would we perhaps think that we might be called to give our lives in service, but are we prepared to obey as far as death to ourselves to uh, go to the, uh, the, the uh, extent of carrying the cross of one who follows the Lord Jesus. He called his disciples to carry the cross and uh, to carry their own crosses. We don't carry the same cross as the Lord Jesus, but we are bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus so that it is evident that we have uh, given up our own rights. And you know, this is exactly what the Philippians needed because there was tension among those in Philippi. Paul uses the example of the Lord Jesus to draw their eyes away from themselves. And Paul himself had learned this lesson a bit himself in chapter two, verse uh, 17. He says, I am willing to be poured out, poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of you all. And Timothy had learned something of this, um, of this character. He uh, is the one who seeks uh, the, the, the well-being, the spiritual well-being of others. He cares for their state in verse 20. He cares sincerely. He cares genuinely. He's not like those who seek their own. Even among believers, we are susceptible to seek our own things. Not Paul, not Timothy. Not Epaphroditus. In the balance of this chapter, we read about him, Epaphroditus, who 
had come and was uh, helping the Apostle Paul in his uh, imprisonment. And verse 30 says that he came close to death for the work of Christ. He was supplying what was lacking in the service of the Philippians towards Paul. Not that the Philippians had forgotten Paul, but they lacked opportunity, as we were told in chapter four. And so Epaphroditus was uh, making up the difference, devoting himself to the service that would sustain Paul, a fellow believer, for the honor of the Savior, their mutual Lord. And so here are some who, in their own day-to-day living, they had learned the example of Christ Jesus, who had entered their circumstances, just as he has entered our circumstances, to be that Savior. But if the Philippians are going to be able to answer that exhortation of chapter 1, if they're going to be able to answer those exhortations of chapter 2 to uh, be uh, united together, to do nothing out of uh, strife or conceit, then their eyes also must be turned upon the humble example of the Lord Jesus. They also would have to hear the Apostle Paul say, let this mind be in you. It was in Christ Jesus. And we see these beautiful examples. And this is how Euodia and Syntyche, these two sisters that we read about in chapter four, they would be able to address uh, in, in a godly way these conflicts that had divided them. And so we might even make this application for ourselves. Are there two sisters who can't get along? Is there another sister? Is there another brother that we find is disagreeable and we feel tension together? May it be that we have the mind of Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it something to be grasped, to maintain a position, but he emptied himself. He made himself empty. He came into our world so that he could do the will of God in humility. May it be so that we know his mind and do the will of God in humility. And this will bring great honor to the name of the Lord Jesus, whom we serve. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we do pray that you will give uh, clarity uh, of, of, uh, of, of vision this one who has come from the highest heights of glory and went to the cross of deepest shame. What a beautiful character is displayed in his ministry here. We pray that you will uh, teach us his ways as we desire to serve him and to honor you. We pray for one another. We pray for ourselves, for the um, outcomes that will bring honor to the name of the Lord Jesus as we have his mind reside in us. We give thanks, our God and Father, in his name. Amen.